<laughs> now we're starting a little bit late this night, so sort of the rain and apparently the tube's gone down. I don't know if anything else has happened, but anyway, here we are. Um, so big welcome to everybody. We've got two great speakers tonight. We've got Charlotte from the Guardian and Tom, where are we talking? From Flux, so he's there. <laughs> Uh, who are going to be talking uh, about cultural design and um, uh, what customers think they're buying. Um, but before we move on to the talks, so there's just some uh, logistics and things that I wanted to go through. First of all, I just want to say a big thank you. I want to say thank you to Lisa, who's from Valtex, who's organised this space to us. <laughs> from, from the very unglamorous kind of like position on the door, Matteo, who's turned up tonight to help us out. Um, and I wanted to ask Lisa just to tell us a little bit about Valtec. So, thank you everyone for coming. Um, we've just moved here very recently. Uh, this is the first meetup that we've hosted here, and I hope to, that we'll host many more. Um, so, I got in touch with Rupert, who is, uh, we do service design at Valtec, and I'm personally interested in it, in it as well. Um, and it so happened that you all needed a space. And we just moved here and it was perfect timing. So, um, and yeah, we've got you here tonight. So, thank you for coming. I hope you have a really good evening. And we're hiring. Who should people talk to for that? <laughs> and, and if you need to use the space, um, if, if you're interested in using this space, um, come and speak to us after. There are a few of us floating around. So. Did Valtech people want to identify themselves? You might get. I'm Val's hiring. He's over there. <laughs> Ramit, Shane, Henry, Connor, George, and Chris. Torheed. So, uh, I'm sorry if I've missed. Oh, you're always here. He was a fan of Anyone else up there? Sorry. Thank okay, you, people. Thank you, Rupert. Thank you. Uh, so the logistics of people found the toilets. Toilets are at the end of this corridor, a bit further on and turn right. If anybody needs to lose. Uh, there is Wi-Fi, so there are Wi-Fi notices here and here, and there's some sheets on the tables over there. So if you want to log in, if you can't be disconnected for a night, that's where you need to go. Uh, timings, so um, there'll be roughly an hour of people talking, and then we will get on to doing an exercise. We'll probably be out of here by about nine o'clock at the latest. So uh, meet, mingle, chat, talk to other people, especially when we get to the exercise point. And at the end of the night, we're going to go to this pub on Essex Road called the Wenlock and Essex. So if you fancy carrying on the conversation at nine o'clock, do make it to the pub. I'm sure there'll be quite a lot of people who are going there. And finally, we have a Christmas party that we're going to be doing on the 7th of December. So put it in your diaries now. Uh, we don't as yet know quite where it is or what we'll be doing, but I'm sure we can work that out. <laughs> it's kind of like the tiny, tiny details. Jenny and I are going to chat about it for an hour or so. It's fine. It's going to be awesome. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Charlotte. So, Charlotte is the, I always get her title, lead UX architect at The Guardian, and she's going to be talking about cultural design. Over to you. All right. Thank you guys for, uh, for making it out. So, cultural design. We'll kind of get into a bit of what I mean about this later, but first, who reads The Guardian? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Excellent. So probably most of you. The rest of you, I won't ask what you read. It's between friends. So the news industry is changing. I don't know if you know. Most of our readers don't know, but the news industry is changing. So we won't go over this graph, but you can see that this lovely, big, fat, juicy bit of print newspaper advertising is shrinking by quite a lot, actually, every year. The projected revenues for the next couple of years are even lower, and it's only going to get worse. So 85 cents out of every new online display advertising dollar goes to Google or Facebook. So there's not super much left over for the Guardian. 
there's a bunch of different disruption things happening in the, the newspaper industry. Won't go over this, but what I'll say is that there are not only problems with the kind of structural advertising revenue decline of the newspaper industry and the rise of these super aggregators like uh, BuzzFeed or, or whatever, but there's, I think there's also a fundamental mismatch between these 1,800 year old structures where a guy, usually a guy, in a room somewhere broadcast to you what the news is, it's not good enough anymore. So the newspaper industry is changing. How can a 200-year-old newspaper like The Guardian change with it? So before I give you the answer to that question or an answer to that question, let's go over the, the brief, all too brief, history of UX and service design with The Guardian beginning, there was a content strategist called Martin Bielan, who is still at The Guardian all these many years later. He was brought in on a contract to help them kind of redesign uh, a flow from the homepage of the website through to crosswords. <laughs> they, <laughs> they worked this thing so bad. Um, not to not to do a Donald Trump impression, but I don't know if any of you have ever done a crossword puzzle. But you know the grid, like where you fill in the letters and the clues. You might want to look at them at the same time. They they weren't even on the same screen in this redesign that they did. And Martin Bielan, the way that he got the UX team or a UX researcher to be hired at the Guardian was to say, look. If we had talked to even one user who did crosswords and shown them this screen, we would have saved nine months of effort, all of this money, and the cost of hundreds of people who pay us money to do these crosswords screaming bloody murder at us. So please, won't you hire a researcher? So the team grew over some years, some more researchers, a couple of information uh, architects were hired, and it shrank with cutbacks in the newsroom, with kind of no investment in UX The Guardian, and now it's grown again to the uh, eight person, pretty evenly gender mixed, so I won't say guy, team uh, that it is today, some of which are, are over them. Um, but the problem with the, the lack of kind of design thinking or design investment at The Guardian really came back to bite the newspaper in the ass. By the way, I, I should make as an aside that it wouldn't be very Guardian-like to come up here and do a Facebook or Google style presentation where everything is the most wonderful, wonderful that ever wonderful and you should all be like us. You should take away from this what you can um, and don't print any of the rest of the stuff that I'm saying. If there are any journals in here, this is on deep background. It's not for publication. <laughs> all right. So then along came OKRs. I will say that before along came OKRs, came uh, a new editor-in-chief, Kath Feiner, and a new CEO, uh, David Pencil. So a new era was ushered in at The Guardian. We stopped focusing on jamming as much traffic through the site as possible at any cost and started thinking, how can we make a deeper connection with our readers? We know that because of the structural decline in display advertising on the site, that jamming a bunch of traffic through this site is a, a fool's errand, is a losing game. It's not going to get us to the, the revenue where we need to be. So what might? So they came up with a wonderful thing called the relationship strategy, which is basically the idea that we are going to form a lasting relationship with our users. We're going to figure out who they are. We're going to figure out what they want, and we will provide that within reason, within the, the limits of kind of good editorial controls of things. 
So part of this strategy is ushering in OKRs. So if you have not read all of these wonderful Google books, the upshot of OKRs is there is a company strategy, there are objectives, stuff that you agree that you're going to do for whatever period of time that roll into the strategy, and there are key results, which is how you know you've achieved the thing that you set out to do. It's a wonderful Silicon Valley type thing, and the idea was that by grafting this piece of Silicon Valley, because they make money from the internet, right, onto this 200-year-old newspaper, profit would be achieved. So, this involved some fundamental changes in the way that things go down at The Guardian. Um, OKRs got off to a very slow start, because this was a thing where there was a lot of skepticism. I won't say especially from the newsroom, but especially from the newsroom, um, about this strategy, about this way of working. Because with OKRs comes this notion of small, empowered, agile teams, which means editorial coming off of the second floor and working together with people from product, people from UX, people from commercial. And there was some skepticism that this would get us to where we needed to be, and especially because it was an imposed top-down thing. This didn't work out so well in the first quarter. Things got off to a slow start, so they thought, all right, maybe we'll bring in somebody who can help us negotiate these new ways of working, at least within the UX team. That was me. They called me a UXer, my background's in product, and I've worked at umpteen different publishers, God help me, including the New York Times. Um, and my mandate was to help people you know, redesign this this way of thinking or, or working. One person in a 200-year-old company can't do it alone. Fortunately, I didn't have to. In quarter two, so the second three-month period that we kept going with OKRs, we thought, all right, imposing OKRs from the top down, no mas, does not work. Let's try co-creating things. So we have this, this weird kind of bidding process where some editors, some product managers, some randos from commercial filled out a form saying, this is what I want a small empowered team to do next quarter. We were meant to pick nine of these. We ended up picking 14, but that was okay because we had buy-in this time from being able to have the teams kind of co-create what they were going to do or kind of co imagine what they were going to do with the stakeholders. The buy-in helped, and the teams started to gel. I would say that the team that Andrea and Monica run started to gel um, in quarter three, so this was last quarter, three months ago, we got faster and better. So this, this bidding process, which we keep doing, it kind of, it gelled with the team. The editors were a lot more involved this time, and we have nine. OKRs, hooray, instead of 14. It's wonderful. And we now have a few teams, more than just Andrea and Monica's team. We have some other teams that kind of fundamentally get discovered. But it was a long row to hoe in order to get there. Now we're facing an inflection point. So we're facing an inflection point because we have some cross-functional teams that do really well. We have some editors who now fundamentally, I would say kind of enjoy working with people from other functions. They enjoy the feeling of being able to get stuff out there, to realize that they are connecting with the audience in a new way, and to see in a way that editors and writers, I think, have not really fundamentally seen before what good their work does, or what bad their work does, um, with the readers that read them. That sounds wonderful, um, but there are some teams that don't work well, that haven't gelled. And when they don't gel, it is usually, usually, I would say a people issue versus a process issue. So the OKRs, I think it's a fundamentally okay system. It's as good as, as any other. I wouldn't recommend that you go out and impose it top-down in your company tomorrow because process changes don't solve 
people problems. I'm sure that you have never realized that yet in your work. So I am telling you, the process changes do not solve people problems. So our next challenge, the challenge that we're facing as, as a UX team, as a product team, as a digital development team who fundamentally has a belief that working in uh, an agile way and working in a user-centric way and getting users into a lab and understanding what they want instead of imposing products and services on them that we don't know whether anybody wants at all. The challenge we face is that the people who believe that are arrayed against a vast army of, uh, of those who want to work in a way that may have worked 200 years ago but doesn't do now. But the issue is that we are very certain that they're right, or that, that we're right, and they are very certain that they're right. And I would say that an even more fundamental issue is they're not convinced that they're right because it's some kind of nefarious type of thing. They're convinced that they're right because they want the best for the Guardian fundamentally, they even want the best for the readers, fundamentally. They just have a disagreement, a fundamental disagreement, about what good for the Guardian and good for the readers looks like. And they believe in their hearts that their way is the best way to get to the goal that we have. When people have a fundamental belief like that, as a service designer, as a UXer, as a whatever the hell you are, that is the hardest thing to change. If somebody is not misinformed or uninformed, but if somebody believes in their hearts that they're right and you're wrong. So what have we learned so far by trying to change the minds of the unchangeable? I would say we've learned that institutional change is usually evolutionary. I think going into this process, Kath and David, the editor-in-chief and the CEO, I think that they thought, this is psychologizing of them, I think that they thought that this was the answer to their problems, to our problems that we have as a company. But there is inertia in a 200 year old company. There is even, I will say this is a veteran of many five dude in a room startups, there is an inertia in a five dude in a room startup and it's just as hard doing that as it is in a huge institution like the Guardian. Institutional change is evolutionary. Institutional change is a battleground for hearts and minds. You have to go person by person by person to get enough people, and enough people, I hate to say this, but in a matrix organization, to get enough people in the right places that you have some hope of heaving the institution forward a couple of inches. Discovery, this beautiful, wonderful product process that is lionized in so many Silicon Valley type uh, books, it works when you make it work. So what do I mean by making it work? I mean taking a, a page out of their book mm -hmm. by tricking people into coming to a design sprint by not telling them that, that it's a design sprint. You just <laughs> tell them, you know, we're, we're going to go in a room and we're going to draw some stuff and then some people are going to come in. It worked. It worked. Um, and I won't tell their story. They, they did a wonderful talk at, uh, at GEM. You should mob them later if you want to hear about how to con people into, uh, into coming to a first design sprint. You have to con people into the first one, but after that, you can tell them it's a design sprint. Have you guys told them that they're design sprints? Okay, now we've told them that they're design sprints, and they still come. It's just the first one that is the hardest. Not everybody fundamentally has the patience or the stomach for change. If you read The Guardian, you know we just went through this voluntary redundancy process, like 200 people have left us. That's okay. Not everybody has the, the patience for levering the organization along by millimeters. Not everybody has the, the stomach for the kind of fundamental worldview <laughs> shift that this requires. It's okay. Let them go because they'll be happier, and eventually you'll be happy. All right, and now, coming to the end of my rabbiting on, and then we can do questions, a few words of advice from the trenches. And this is not just from The Guardian, but this is from 
everywhere else that I've worked, and hopefully it'll be applicable to where you are as well. A lot of people around shared homes. So, like I said, and this is, it's so often said that it's kind of become a trope at The Guardian, but at The Guardian, everybody has the fundamental strength and health of The Guardian their fundamental goal. It has that public service as a goal. It has this idea of liberal journalism and informed society making a just society as their goal. So if you can say, and you can say truthfully, your goal is my goal, we may differ right now on how to get there, but my God, we're going to get there together. That creates some sense of alignment in the people that you're going to need to work with. If you don't have fundamentally the same goals, that, that's a whole different problem that I'm not going to help you with right now. <laughs> this one, please take pictures of this one and tweet this one, because if there is a nugget that I want you to take from this talk, it's this one. Communicate the value of your process by directly involving other people in your process. What, what the hell does that mean? That's a little bit convoluted. What I mean is, if you believe that doing user research is valuable, get other people to observe you when you do it. Do a playback of the research that you've done. If you believe that doing prototyping of some kind is valuable, invite people in the room to co-create those prototypes with you. Let them see the process in action. Let them see the good that the process does. And they will, hopefully, with any luck, begin to value it. And I'll show you one example from The Guardian. There's only one UXer in this photo. So this is a product manager. This is Paul, the UXer. Developer, commercial guy, my god, designer, and another product manager. There's only one UXer in that room. But everybody else in that room, there were 20 other people in this room, including some people from editorial, when this was taken. Every single person there believed in the value of doing discovery. And this was uh, when we did an opportunity tree. What is on the board is a diagram that the product manager drew about how we got here so far. So it's deliberately bringing people into the process, making them feel investment, making them feel like they contributed to getting as far as you got. And the process from here, this was what our dear departed Chief Digital Officer, Aaron Pilhoffer, called a dumpster fire. This was the team that was a dumpster fire, and now we're going pretty well, because we deliberately tried to get everyone involved in this process. Other things. Prioritize mindset change, not framework change. We already talked about this. There is no way that a process change, that a framework change, that introducing OKRs, that introducing any other thing that's written about by some billionaire in a book will do anything for you unless you bring hearts and minds along with you. And it's mindset change and it's a fundamental investment in the righteousness of what you're doing, because it's the guardian, we can talk about righteousness, in the righteousness of what you're doing that will bring people along, and then you won't have to impose frameworks on them, because they will want to come along on this journey with you. Again, person by person, and then team by team. So if you want to get an editor on your side, and they are the kind of top dude, you don't go straight to him and try to convince him of the righteousness of what you're doing. Convince the guy, convince the editor for whom that editor that you want is their boss's boss's boss. Go to the very bottom, involve them, that will roll up to them telling their boss, hey, I'm in this huddle, I'm in this team, and we're doing awesome shit, and we're getting such great feedback from readers. And then they'll tell their boss, and they'll tell their boss. And then the guy at the top will aggrandize what you've done in a board meeting, but that's okay as long as they aggrandize the right stuff. Speaking the language of your colleagues, especially at an organization that is 200 years old, that has 
its own language, its own way of being, its own way of speaking is really important. You cannot bring people into a meeting, show them a wireframe that has like Helvetica instead of the Guardian's special Egyptian font, and expect them to talk about anything except the font's wrong. <laughs> you cannot show them a wireframe where the picture is like cropped and expect them to think about anything else except that's not 5-3, is it? You have to meet people where they are, speak their language, and get get your process and get your stuff out of the way enough that they can see fundamentally what the what the choice is in front of them or what the way forward is in front of them. So don't let any little thing that you can move out of the way work your process by leaving them. And then the last thing that I will say, and this is probably the hardest for most people to achieve, it's the hardest for me to achieve because I'm the type of person who stands up in front of 120 people and tells you my opinion. By the way, this is all in the, uh, the Guardian's opinion orange because my opinion. <laughs> um, it's probably the, the only thing I'll ever write for the Guardian. Um, <laughs> this is my moment to shine. Anyway, be willing to give away your glory in pursuit of a larger goal. So we had a meeting yesterday, I won't tell you about it. But what happened, and I've heard this from five different people, was the senior managers only talked as if they you know, were all the ones who were doing this work, and they were responsible for the data-driven process, and they were responsible for the user testing, and they were responsible for whatever. They might be aggrandizing your glory, but they're aggrandizing the right things because they want to be seen to be data-driven, they want to be seen to be doing user research, they want to be seen to be doing whatever, and you know what? That is a massive, fundamental, earth-shattering shift from where we were even 18 months ago. So eventually, I hope, it will shift from I did this to the team did this, and the team included this person, this person, this person, this person, whatever. That will come in 18 months. As long as they're aggrandizing the right things right now, you let them aggrandize the hell out of it. And that goes for whether it's your colleague or whether it's your client. If it's your client, you know they're going to aggrandize it anyway. So that's kind of okay. And this brings us to the end of my talk. And you can follow me on Twitter and all that jazz. <laughs> Somebody has to go first. Come on. Now. This is a really random and probably selfish question. Yeah. Probably want to see it, but what's an opportunity tree? Okay. So <laughs> there is this. Um, look it up. It's this product manager consultant called uh, Teresa Torres. What's her website? Do you guys know? Is it no. Product talk. Anyway, look up yeah. Teresa Torres Opportunity Tree. It's really good. Other people? I'll hang around afterwards. Oh, yeah. That's really interesting. Um, I was wondering um, how many of those those projects, I mean, I'm not sure exactly when you started, how many of those have kind of concluded and like, um, finished and you've actually seen, like, gone through that whole process or something? Or is it yeah, so this is the thing. We've been doing the, the OKR thing for about a year. Um, I would say that a lot of the teams are through the initial discovery phase and into the kind of first phases of let's build stuff, let's live test it, let's put it out on the site. I don't know of any team that's much further than that. You guys are about to productionize some wonderful emails. Please sign up to our lovely Guardian Daily emails. Oh, and also uh, give us five pounds a month so we can continue to exist. <laughs> um, so that, that's the team that I'm on. I would love to see a, a nice little spike of people becoming Guardian members. Um, so we're hoping kind of first quarter of next year you'll start to see some fairly fundamental changes, but there's nothing that I can point you to right now that's live on the site that's like super easy. Like I said, it's it's a 200 year old really big ship. It takes a long time. Yeah, what'd you have? 
Can I ask, I just wonder if, um, I never worked for newspapers, so I don't know, and I understand that the industry is struggling. Yeah. I wonder if you think there's anything unique about service design and the whole kind of actual process in a newspaper that would, wouldn't be the same if you were selling back games or you know, any other industry? Yes. Um, something that is fundamentally different, though I will say that this is worse at the New York Times than it is at the Guardian. I should say it's more pronounced, not worse at the New York Times than it is at the Guardian. There fundamentally has to be a wall, unless you are some crap thing like Buzzfeed. There fundamentally has to, sorry, sorry. <laughs> like I said, deep background, not for publication. <laughs> Unless you are some outlet that does not have any kind of journalistic standard, there has to be, in, in the public interest, in the name of the public good, some separation between the journalism that is created and the pursuit of money, fame, glory, profits, whatever. There, there has to be some fundamental separation unless you want to say oh my god trump was elected that means people are depressed let's post nothing but like cat gifts or something <laughs> um so when you as a as a service designer or ux or whatever are trying to say we should become more user-centric we should become closer to our readers there's only so close that you can become and still maintain a journalistic standard. I don't necessarily believe that, but that's the argument that you will get from everyone who works in the editorial side of the newspaper, from the, the lowliest copy person up to probably the, the editor-in-chief. I think there is a good argument to be made for not lowering the journalistic standards in favor of chasing whatever. Um, but I also, if I'm putting forward my own opinion, I would have to say that you have to have a pretty low opinion of your readers to think that wanting to make money or needing to, to make money to fundamentally exist as a newspaper and your journalistic standards are diametrically opposed because your audience fundamentally wants what you provide, otherwise nobody would ever read the article. So, there is a difference there, but I would say it's a difference of a degree and not of kind, if that makes sense. So Rupert's coming with the, the sheep hook to get off the stage. I will answer your question, but I will also say that I'll hang around after. So, you know, if you want to queue up and see it, it's cool. I'll be around. Um, so what we're doing, um, I'll just talk about the, the team that I'm on because it's, it's a famous example. So what we're doing is basically we are kind of rejiggering our, our membership platform to, to tailor it around not only this idea that people love The Guardian, they are fundamentally cause driven, they want to give us money because they see The Guardian as, as a public utility that must fundamentally exist for the good of mankind, with people also want some stuff when they give you money. So we have commercial guys come into the team and we're working really closely with them to say, look, we want fundamentally to, to offer these benefits to our users. We know that the fundamental draw is always going to be journalism. But let's do a conjoint analysis or a survey or whatever to see what stuff people want. Run that through some framework that the business guys, Will and Charles, are cooking up of making sure that the thing that we're going to offer, that we want to offer, is also fundamentally profitable. So we work really closely with them really early in the process to make sure that we don't get to the end to a place where what we want to offer is fundamentally unviable as a, as a business proposition. Um, but we in the membership team are probably the closest, or, or the ad guys, obviously there's a whole advertising product team <coughs> to uh, commercials than just about anybody.
Right so on top of me afterwards, thank you guys, and now the much more interesting speech. Give it up, Clearly, you're going to be the thing that I'm going to be discovering myself. There we go. I'm just going to implement it across any project that I do from this point it's on. Good idea, <laughs> you need to write it down, right? And you can write it down, <laughs> so we can share. Uh, thank you very much, Charlotte. Um, uh, I'm now going to introduce Tom. Da da. Hey. Hey. Who is a senior consultant at Flux, who I had the great pleasure of being a colleague of for about a year. I think we managed to do some quite grim projects in King's Cross. There's a nice picture of one later on. Very good. <laughs> uh, and tonight you are talking about what is the customer really buying? I will leave you in top ten. So, um, uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, my, my background is I used to work. Uh, about seven years, I was um, I became head of digital at the Times, which is a 230-year-old newspaper. Uh, and, um, so in that role, I was kind of more like a product owner, I guess. And um, uh, then about three years ago, I left, became a consultant, and joined Flux, and started doing what I guess is more like service design. So I feel like I haven't read all the books by people from Silicon Valley, uh, but it's been an amazing experience for me, and this is kind of one of the things that I found most interesting during that process, was the question of really understanding what it is, that relationship between somebody selling something and the person buying it, and when sometimes it's a lot less obvious what's going on than it looks at first. So, this is the site, I was thinking the project would be slightly larger than it is, but so this is how this says, people who buy vinyl, 52% of people have a turntable they use, 41% of people have a turntable they don't use, 7% of people have no turntable. And I thought this is really, really interesting, because you can look at this and you can say, there's quite a natural reaction, I hear a certain amount of laughter around the room, where you go, what the fuck are these 48% of people doing? <laughs> you know, what kind of person buys a record when they don't have any way of playing it? They're kind of pretentious. Like, what are they doing? Um, but what I thought was, you look at this, I think this is a really, really interesting insight because these people are getting some kind of successful economic, emotional exchange with the people selling the records to them. And we can either look at it and say, we're only going to think about these people. Or we can look at the whole lot of them and try and understand who they are, what they're getting out of it. And if you're running a record business, this is half of your profit. So this makes about 10 million, 10 million quid for the UK record industry comes from people who don't use record players buying records. So understanding that, optimizing for it, making sense of it is really important for what we do. Uh, and records are quite weird, but books are really, really weird. Um, and this is a, there's a fantastic blog post you can find, um, if you email me, I'll pass you the link, by a guy called Jonathan McCormon, who talks about why you buy books that you don't read. Um, and again, you can look at it and say, well, because you're an idiot. Um, but if you're working in publishing and you only see publishing as the transfer of information from an author's brain <coughs> to a customer's brain, you're probably not going to be very successful in publishing and selling books. So some of the arguments he comes up with, he talks about reasons why it's okay to buy books you never read. The first one that's really that's important for everyone is by buying a book, you are defining yourself. So if you, um, if you decide you're the sort of person who's interested in, you want to be the sort of person who's interested in Russian literature, for example, he uses. Actually being a person who's interested in Russian literature requires a really significant investment of time and effort, you know, years of time to learn it and to understand and get something from it. But by giving a small amount of money, you know, 10 quid, you can be the sort of person who owns a Russian, a piece of Russian literature, and you are, you are the sort of person who buys that book. And I think we shouldn't ignore that transaction. We should try and understand what that transaction means. There's another thing which is the kind of assertion of support, which we touched on with The Guardian. It's like, I think The Guardian should exist so maybe I will give some money to their charity. Uh, and uh, that applies to books and records, and it's the thinking, 
one of the examples he gives is he talks about Blu-rays. He says Blu-ray kind of video discs really only exist so that people who are really into movies can commit to owning a movie on a very sort of fancy format, is the part of it. Um, and then the third one is a statement of intent. And we did some work at Flux where we were looking at uh, those sites where there are videos teaching you how to do stuff. Um, and there you got the feeling that signing up for a course about something is a statement of intent. You may never watch the course, but you've got value from that exchange. When you look at online universities, you get these online universities, you can sign up to do physics at MIT, and you may never do any of the courses or watch the videos, but you have some kind of exchange with MIT and you've got some value from it. And understanding that value is really interesting. Understanding, in terms of the definition, it's not just like wearing a badge. It's literally you're paying money to become the sort of person that, that reads a book like uh, Capital. That's my wife's copy, not mine. I didn't buy it. Um, and when you, when you look at books, one of, because they're such strange products, the way they're retailed has become very interesting. So this is a, a bookshop in a old theatre in Buenos Aires, which is an extraordinary place to, to do shopping, because shopping itself is quite important for books. Uh, and the other end of the scale, this is a shop in um, Tokyo, which sells one book at a time. So if you go in there, it's got one book, it has multiple copies of that one book. Um, but then it just has that book, and you have to go there um, a couple of, you know, if you go there two weeks later, you have a different book, but just one at a time. And sometimes this feels a bit like marketing. It's like, oh, we don't worry about it. This is just the layer of polish you put on top. But I think this is actually the core function of your product. If you don't understand a book, something that does all of these things for the customer, you're going to have a hard time being a publisher or making sense of that, I think. Um, so my, that is my theory is that it's part of the real core of the product. So I've got some other examples of this. Um, books are very kind of weird, uh, and got some slightly less weird examples. So, and before I get to that slide, you know what you're selling, you're a company, but what the customers are actually buying is mysterious. So, um, I'm literally now showing you my holiday slides. So, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went on a holiday to Barcelona with my family, uh, and we stayed in this Airbnb. Uh, which was this amazing hipster flat right in the center of Barcelona. It has 1930s graffiti on the wall. It has a bicycle on top of a wardrobe, which I didn't know was a thing, but now I know. Uh, it, this was the front door. Um, and it had hipster plumbing. Uh, and when I was, when I was, and this is true, when I was fiddling with this plumbing trying to get, you know, a shower with a sensible temperature, I realized that what the kind of transaction I had with Airbnb was very strange. It was very different from uh, seeking accommodation. I wasn't finding somewhere to stay. What I was doing was swapping lives with the people who lived in this apartment. I mean, I wasn't swapping, they weren't in my house, but I was paying money to go and live in their house. And it was much closer to something like Westworld, you watch Westworld, where they go and live with robots in, that sounds strange if you haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> It's, it's, it felt like a really strange product, and the exchange that I was having with them was extraordinary and really interesting. Uh, and we often go to these places at Airbnb, and occasionally you stay on one which just feels a bit like a normal holiday net. It's fine. But when you stay in somewhere where it's clearly somebody's house and they're interesting or they're an interesting part of town, it's a really special, unusual thing. Um, and I think the difference between a product offering accommodation and the thing that Airbnb offer is significant. And if you're, if you're Hilton Hotels, and Hilton Hotels has about 700,000 rooms, Airbnb now has about a million rooms, if they're looking at them saying, how do we compete with that? It's a really peculiar, interesting problem. I don't get much further than that, other than that's why I like my job, because we have these really interesting problems. But that, that idea, I think, probably always going to go around. I think if Airbnb was saying, right, we want to go into the business market, if I've got to go to Leamington Spa because I'm working for National Grid for three days, I'm not sure I want to swap places with somebody living in Leamington Spa. I want to just go and stay in the hotel. So there's, there's something in that product that I think is unusual and is in the relationship is not at all obvious between me and them. Uh, as I said, I used to work for the, for the Times. Uh, and there's a, 
this, I'm going to say this, and this is massive amounts of post-rationalization, thinking it through afterwards. If I'm suggesting that what I'm saying is a strategy that we had when I was at the time, that is entirely not true. And the series here who worked with me when we were at the Times can um, verify that. When I look back at my, my time there, I think one of the ways of understanding the difference between what the Times was doing and what the Guardian and the Mail were doing, and I would like to say the Guardian and the Mail, but I don't know what the Guardian and the Mail did was, um, I think we have fundamentally different understandings of the relationship between us and the customer. And I think what the customer was buying or consuming uh, was fundamentally different. So what the Guardian and the Mail did was they're fundamentally, their, their unit of production and consumption is the story. Uh, what they do is write stories and watch journalists do is write stories. And when the internet appeared and all the limits on how much you could write in space and how many people you could reach disappeared, the Guardian and the Mail picked that up and said, we are going to make more stories, we're going to make stories for everyone, we're going to tell more stories everywhere. The Mail's approach was to build the largest pile of shit that's ever been assembled, <laughs> put it in front of the middle of the internet, and then try and make money by charging people to talk to the people looking at the pile of shit. Uh, and that hasn't worked all that well for them in terms of making money. The Guardian's approach was much, was very different. It was to say, can we write the best journalism in the world? Can we find the best stories? Can we find big exclusives? And can we get them everywhere in the world? Can we get them on Twitter, on Facebook, and everywhere, and get the biggest, the biggest audience possible? So the Times' approach was very, very different. The Times' product and the Times' relationship with its customers was fundamentally breakfast. So what the Times' relationship with the customer was, it was a, uh, a thing you did usually in the morning where you'd spend 10, 15, 20 minutes reading the newspaper. And you would start, you'd pick it up, you'd have a start, a beginning, and a middle, and an end. And when you got to the end, you had a sense of completion. You felt like you had consumed the paper and you were set up for the day. You might do it at home on your, on your breakfast table. You might do it on a train on the way into work. Uh, you might look at it later in the day, you might do other things around it, but fundamentally that was the process that you were selling, that was the relationship with the customer. And if you're doing that, and this, this is a very, very strong relationship, so people in their 30s might have been doing this for 20 years. Uh, people would have been doing this because their parents did it and their grandparents did it. And it was just a, it's a ritual and a routine that people um, adopted. Uh, and if you can, uh, what we did digitally was exactly the same on an iPad or a or whatever. Um, and if you can do this, if you can get 15, 20 minutes of people's time every day for 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years, you've got an incredibly strong relationship and you can clearly make money out of that. So if you look at Starbucks, how much money do you spend on Starbucks every day? You can clearly get a couple of quid a day out of people doing this because you're an important significant part of that day. Um, so I felt like that was a very, very different way of approaching um, how, how that relationship works. Um, and the reason why um, newspapers, now they're both hot, so I can't tell which one's mine. Um, I think the reason why newspapers quite naturally gravitated to stories is because they're run by journalists, and journalists live stories. If you are a journal when you're a journalist, you write stories all day long. If you write a good story, you're happy. If you write a bad story, you're unhappy. You're judged by your stories. The entire thing is your story. So it's not weird that they would think we have a free reign now to tell more stories, bigger stories, better stories for more people. Um, if you work in the, um, the fizzy drink industry, it's not unreasonable to feel that you're judged by the quality of your fizzy drinks. So this is Don Keogh, who was chairman of Coca-Cola. And this is him in April 1985 when he stood up at the Lincoln Center in New York and he said, I have improved Coca-Cola. He said, this is new Coke. Uh, we have gone away, we've looked at the formula and we have improved it and it is now better. And he now has a great fanfare. And for about, uh, I think, a couple of weeks or a month, people were like, oh, okay, fine, I'll give that a go. Uh, and then this movement started to build and people completely freaked out. 
so in the in the southern states, the U.S., uh, people saw this in terms of the Civil War. They said this was Yankee interference in southern affairs. Um, uh, in Cuba, Fidel Castro was a big Coke drinker. I assume it's rum and Coke. Uh, and he said this new flavor was um, American uh, capitalist decadence. Um, and there was just this enormous groundswell of people freaking out. And uh, three months later, uh, in the afternoon, uh, ABC was running General Hospital, which was their big soap, but interrupted General Hospital with a news flash to say that Coca Cola had changed the formula back. <laughs> Classic code. And so Don stood up and he did this extraordinary speech you can find on YouTube um, where he said things like this. He said, you can't measure people's affection for Coca-Cola any more than you can measure love, patriotism, or pride. And he said, this is actually a quote from somebody who wrote in to him and told him this. Changing Coke is like God making the grass purple. <laughs> so um, when you look at these things, the, the, the thing that the company is selling and the thing that we as consumers are buying is often different. So with vinyl, it's probably something about identity. It's also about interior decorations, about things you want in your home. With books, it's, you could go on forever, but it's about ambition and purpose and self-improvement and furniture is a big chunk of it. And you see companies like um, uh, Fiden or there's this company that produces enormous books that cost like three grand and have them stand hold them up. And that's not weird or mad, it's because they're furniture and they're just better furniture than other types. Uh, Airbnb, my theory is that it's kind of swapping with somebody else's life. Uh, newspapers all the time are selling with this morning ritual uh, and with Coca-Cola it's, it's something else, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, so the problem with all this, actually when I, look, when I write this list down, it kind of feels obvious. You look at it and go, well, yeah, I mean, that's not that. Um, and again, it feels a bit like the sort of things you hear with branding. So you get like, you know, Tom's shoes will say, oh, we've got an emotional resonance with our shoes because when you buy them, a kid in Africa gets a pair of shoes. I do think this is quite different. I think this is, this is a difference between what we're thinking and what the, what the company is selling. And I think what's interesting is how companies can go years, centuries without working this stuff out. So if you look at the history of Airbnb, how they evolved, they spent about two years going through Y Combinator, getting a bunch of funding um, when they thought they were about cheap accommodation for, for tech conferences and literally living on airbeds in people's houses. And it was only when they, they at some point realized their site just looked horrible. They'd been scraping listings from Craigslist. And they just had all these crappy looking pictures of horrible looking apartments. And they went to New York where they had a bunch of people um, signed up. They rented a $5,000 like SLR camera and they went around door to door taking beautiful pictures of these houses and stuck them on the side. And suddenly the thing changed from being, here's somewhere weird and cheap you can say, to I can buy that lifestyle, I can buy that life. So these things aren't, I think, obvious and I think companies, it's difficult to work these out. And the reason it's so difficult is because we don't have a clue what we're buying. You know, we, if you to ask somebody, why they're buying something, they can't give you a useful, useful answer because it's an emotional reaction. Your brain isn't really involved. The reason you go in and decide to spend 20 pounds on a vinyl record, you can't explain that when you've got it on Spotify, you, to, but you can't usefully explain that. Um, so the work that, the, one of the things I found really interesting about the work I'm doing now with Flux, and in fact, one of the things I learned from Rupert while there, was the process of trying to understand that. So. And that's really about interviewing people, spending time with people. Uh, it's not what they tell you because they don't know, but it's how they talk about things. It's the context of it. Um, it's trying to understand and make sense of what that emotional relationship is. So a couple of stories from Flux. Um, we did a project before I got there. Um, we did a few insurance projects. We did a project with a company called More Than. And insurance fundamentally, traditionally, is a financial service. So a customer has risk. Uh, if that risk comes in, the insurance company pays them off so they're, they're not out of pocket from that risk. Um, when we went into more than when we spoke to people, this is a woman who runs a call center team there. 
she said people ring up and they are in distress their house is flooded they've been robbed you know whatever something bad has happened to them and what we want to do is help them uh, but what we have to do is say can i have your policy number and let's look up and find out if you're properly covered for this this thing so we said to them well can we can we fix that somehow and we worked with them to change their processes and we did experiments to find out if we can make this work we said when they ring up, you say, can I help? And then you spend time working out you can help them. So you can put them in touch with local um, repair people. You can just help them through the process, help them work on the doing that. And at some point later on, you say, oh, OK, now, if you've got your policy number, let's work out whether we're paying for this or you're paying for this. And this had an amazing impact on the company, because the, the kind of net promoter scores went from whatever a bad net promoter score is, or whatever a good net promoter score is. Uh, this was the core of their TV advertising that year. And um, people like this woman said, the conversation would have so much happier and better within the full sense. It really changed the way they looked at it. Um, you don't have to always do this um, face to face. So we did another piece of work for a travel company. The travel company was wanting to sell. Uh, I'm obviously not mentioning the name of the company, and many of you will know who it is trying to sell holidays for groups of lads and groups of girls, maybe going to Madela or Ibiza. Um, and they were looking at how they were sold. And we found from, you could get a lot of this from their social media, from reviews on sites, from the way they talked about it in forums. A traditional holiday company set up for people who want to go away with their family. They're very concerned about which is the hotel, what town's it nearby, what country is it in, all of these details. If you're trying to organize a holiday like this, it's logistics, it's like business travel. How do you get 15 lads passport details and uh, their um, you know, payment deposits in a 24-hour period before the booking closes? So we discovered that the, the product they were buying, they really didn't care whether it was in Magdalene or Ibiza, particularly. They cared whether they could ring up and say, right, it's these 15 of us, here's their email addresses, you contact them and we'll however you arrange it. So it was about it was about providing service and providing, like I said, logistics. It's much closer to business travel than it would be to a traditional holiday. Um, and this was the project I worked with Rupert on. You'll see I've cleverly um, covered up the logo there. Um, uh, this isn't quite as bleak as it looks. Um, I don't know if you can see this chap sitting there with his head in his hands. Um, so this was with a, a plumbing company that was sending plumbers and, and engineers out around the, around the country. And we spent a long time working with the plumbers and in the call centers. Um, and this guy was sitting there. He hasn't just got his head in his hand. He's actually talking on his phone, so he looks, looks worse than it is. But he was on a 45-minute long call to his call center to decide whether to dig up the, the concrete in the front room of a young family's house. And the family's house there. So it was a really complicated thing, and it was massively involved thing. And what I sort of realized from that was that this approach of um, what does the customer want, or what's the customer think they're buying, and what does the company think they're selling, also works within companies. So you can see what the call center thinks they're doing and what the engineer thinks they're doing can be fundamentally completely at odds. They're both working really hard. They're both trying to achieve the same thing. but. They're just literally they 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 are not they're not in the same in the same universe. Um, and this picture again, I was hoping the project would be slightly bigger. Uh, I don't have anything to say about it. It's just, it was a really funny post. <laughs> bigger slides next time. <laughs> um, so just going back to this, uh, really looking at this again, just sort of reminds me why uh, I think it's really really interesting work that we all do and figuring out these kind of questions is why. Uh, I enjoy going to work every day. So thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. We had one last time as well. <laughs> Message that I'm just like other 
like middle class liberals next year and it's okay and I'm going to worry. Um, or conversely, where I'm an express reader, and actually what I wanted to buy was a message that said, there's a bunch of idiots out there, they don't get it, they don't understand the world, and a lot of them foreigners. Is it okay to sell that? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, I think if, if there's a moral judgment about whether that's the right thing for them to do, you know, I wouldn't feel happy working for the Express or the Mail. I just wonder if, if, but, saving, if saving media industry is the same as saving journalism, there's, there's a difference between the two. So, so what, I, what I felt was, <laughs> was that they were really quite different things. I think, I think the, I think... I was looking, you know, towards the end, particularly after leaving the Times, um, looking at that we were providing product that people really enjoyed. And so the people who, who use the Times in that way, they get the Times every day, they read it, they get 15 minutes of value out of it. And when you talk to them, they really enjoy it. It is good. They are, they are happy with it. And if you're understanding products in any way and wanting to manage products in any way, that's clearly a good product that people enjoy. Um, I think a lot of the challenges of the media industry have been where you have a very difficult conflict between, well, fundamentally, the, the question I haven't done here is you cannot know what you're selling and who's buying it. You can also not know your customers. So you can't talk about guardian customers because they don't have any. Well, they have advertisers, and they have advertisers not their customers, I think. So, I don't know if that's an unfair thing to say, but, but the people who pay money to The Guardian are advertisers, and they're kind of charitable donation thing. But, but just as if you look at Facebook, Facebook doesn't have any customers. They have advertisers. So 95% of Facebook revenue comes from advertisers. It doesn't have to be that way. That's not the way you have to run an organization. If you look at... Um, Tencent in China, which is essentially a Chinese Facebook, um, something like 20% of their advertising is from their, their revenue is from advertising. The rest of it comes from transactions and enabling shopping through their platform and that sort of thing. So it's a fundamentally different way of looking at it. But I think if you, I think the problem for media has been their customers, meaning advertisers, don't really like them. They're not offering a very good service for them anymore. The shiny new things Facebook comes on, and they're very happy to offer them to Facebook. The people consuming that media aren't, aren't in that, there, there isn't an economic equation between them. So, if, if you look at when I'm talking about publishers, if you want to be a book publisher, you probably need to understand that economic transaction. There isn't one between a free publisher, there isn't one between BuzzFeed and people who read BuzzFeed. There's no, there's no money involved. So that makes it very difficult to offer them a good product. Thanks very much. Um, as I think you talked about a couple of examples that you used um, of like scenarios and like, um, case studies that worked well, what you found things. And the, like, after that kind of investigation stage of trying to figure out, figure out what's, what's really going on in this match, um, has there ever been something that you've tried and it hasn't worked out? Oh, no. Um, <laughs> no, and, that, and, and absolutely, that, and there is actually, it's a very easy thing to present, is that stage of the work. It's very easy to say, we went there and we observed this, and it's true. And actually making those changes is much, much more. And, you know, you're often not on the project for long enough to do it. Um, often, it's fundamentally disconnect, you know, I mean, the, the really challenging thing is if you're in a company where its business model is very problematic. So you can see exactly how they can do better service, we can do better this or that. But if 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 the customers aren't customers, that's always quite a difficult thing to do. So, so absolutely, that I am presenting the easy, fun part of the project. The actually making those changes in deployment is, is much, much, much more difficult. But I think if you have that truth at the beginning of it, it's helpful. And I think you're, you're able to present ideas that are much more interesting and credible if you're able to get to the bottom of what, what that customer relationship is. Thank you. Um, I've got a question about the Times and the experience and, and, and the brand and the 
stacks are much more. Not just one that if you have a connected current standard in difference between a product which is just true and a product which is just not true. Like refer to you go to say Barcelona as a it's not just the functionality of where you can stay, but you can stay and then start and it's just the same. I, th I think they're almost completely different products. I think that's the thing. I think, I think there is, again, just as there's a there's confusion about who the customer is, there can be a confusion about just different products. I think that the experience, it's, it's like comparing going to a football match with buying a pair of shoes. You know, they both could be related to sport in some way, but they're not actually the same product at all. So I think that's where you can get confusion, where you're, you're thinking people are buying one thing when actually they're buying something else, is when these things can get very entangled. Great, thank you very much indeed. I think Tom and I both had slightly weird experiences on that particular plumbing project. <laughs> I remember being stood in the basement of raw sewage yeah. for about three hours at one point. <laughs> um, so uh, that's it for the talking this evening. When you go and get a drink, have a wee, do all those kind of like logistics things. When you come back, I'd like you to get into groups of four or five and discuss how would you use service design to, inter to improve the internal processes in your company?